Hi guys, welcome back to The Social Tune and a brand new episode of Record Roundup. So I'm actually kind of enjoying this handheld format. I'd actually be really curious to hear your guys' feedback on that. I know you guys are overall pretty positive, but this is a series that I make for you. And considering that I already had the retrospective ramble series, do you particularly mind that it's kind of handheld and freeformed? I don't know, it's just meant that I've been able to get to a lot more records than I normally would do on Record Roundup. Which I will say has been very useful leading up towards the end of the year. So leave your feedback on that in the comments, as well as your thoughts on this first album. So Years and Years is a band that I have a bit of a weird relationship with. In the sense that I haven't really been a huge fan of their albums, but I have been big fans of a lot of their singles. With my personal favorite, honestly, being King. Yeah, I know that that's a cliched answer, but it really is a fantastic pop song. One that I really wish had crossed over into the US. And I say that because I think this band has a ton of crossover appeal. And nowhere is that more obvious than on this new album, Palo Santo. This is basically an album about a sexual and self discovery within a relationship. Which is made even more dramatic by the fact that the songwriting is peppered with religious iconography. I mean, you have the obvious examples on songs like Sanctify and Hallelujah, but even the title and its title track have religious and sexual subtext to them. And what I really appreciated about this album, more than anything else, is just how catchy it is. This is really where years and years have got into their stride and are making some of the best hooks of their entire careers. With a song like Sanctify, honestly reminding me of something Justin Timberlake would have done in the mid-2000s. Now, in terms of albums that borrow religious iconography to talk about love and relationships and sex, this is nowhere near on the level of, say, Hose Your Cell title album from 2014. However, if you're looking for a version of that album with a bit more pop appeal to it, then Palo Santo is a very good fit for that. I really did enjoy it. Really strong 7 out of 10, definitely a step in the right direction for this band. And I really do hope that they continue to pursue this sound because it really is one that flatters them. Are you riding? Say you never ever leave from beside me Cause I want you and I need you And I'm down for you always KB Do you love me? Are you riding? Another year, another Drake album. This one having a lot more writing on it than some of his previous releases. I mean, he called that project of his last year a playlist so he could basically get away with it if it turned out to not be all that good. But on top of everything else, Drake was just coming off the heels of one of the most devastating beefs that he had ever gotten into, where Pusha T utterly destroyed his public image with the story of Adidas. Now, obviously that track never actually hit the charts, and I'm sure that many, many Drake fans never even heard it. But for those of us who are casual listeners of Drake, and of course for fans of Pusha T, it was a deafening blow that Drake pretty much couldn't reply to. But hey, this album came off the heels of it, and there was some buzz suggesting that he was going to respond to some of the things Pusha T had accused him of. And if that's what you're expecting going into this album, boy are you going to be disappointed. Because yes, we do get some references to the feud. However, all of those references could very easily just be construed as the usual Drake bullshit that we've heard on the past three or four albums from him. About how people are mean to him, and about how his fans don't really get him, and that he's tired of the fame, and that he's mistreating women, and that they're not appreciating him. It's the same bullshit, except somehow even worse than usual. Because Drake decided to make this release a double album. One that spans over an hour, where the first half is hip-hop, and the second half is R&B. Or at least officially, because if you were to actually dive into each each of those sides individually, you would find plenty of hip-hop on the R&B side and plenty of R&B on the hip-hop side. And by the way, when I say R&B, this is not on the level of hold on, we're going home. And Drake's bars and lyrics are worse than ever, whether it be his constant fear to actually name names, to the entirety of a song like Ratchet Birthday Party, which is just cringeworthy, to the entirety of the other song, I'm Upset, where he is just whining constantly for over three minutes. And on top of that, the energy on this album only appears in brief, short bursts, which are usually let down by absolutely horrendous production. I mean, these beats are expensive, but that's all they have going for them, as on a compositional level, 
these are amateurish at best. And to be perfectly honest, the only songs that I could see myself going back to on this are some of the singles. God's Plan may be the drakiest Drake song that has ever existed for his monotone delivery, the one or two good lines, and the admittedly catchy beat. But again, it's catchy, and I can at least appreciate it for all the memes and all the fun that has come out of it. Not to mention the music video, where, yes, Drake's charity there is still to be appreciated. And I'll be honest, I didn't hate In My Feelings either, and Nice For What is by far the best song on this album, as it has a pulse and groove to it that no Drake song has had in at least the past three years. But everything else here is disposable Drek, which isn't even brave enough to get direct. And don't even get me started on his collaboration with Michael Jackson on this project. That in particular really did make me sick to my stomach, especially with how, let's be honest, bad MJ sounded on that. But all of that has just been building up with more and more frustration until I can safely say that Scorpion, it's probably Drake's worst album to date. And while the one or two songs do save it from getting a lower score than this, I'm still feeling charitable in giving this a very strong 3 out of 10. Drake, there is no excuse for this, and if you were looking to come back into the hip-hop community after Pusha T completely body slammed you, this was definitely not the way to do it. Skip this album. So Freddie Gibbs has had a weird couple of years. As some of you may know, while touring abroad, he actually got himself arrested. And ever since then, he's kind of been trying to get his career back on the right track. On top of that, he's been working on his final album for years now. And yet every single time we got a new release, he always insisted that this wasn't it. Now for me, Freddie Gibbs has always fallen into a bit of a weird place. Obviously, like pretty much everyone else, I think that his collaboration with Madlib on Pinata in 2014 is the best thing he's ever done. But since then, while I will say that I think that he's a very good lyricist, and that he's definitely got a voice and a flow that do appeal to me, a lot of his projects, in my opinion, can kind of feel very similar, and without Mad Lib's production to really make him stand out, he's just a really good MC who's just kind of a step below other MCs who do similar kind of rap music, like say Pusha T, who always has great producers backing him up. And on this new release, Freddie Gibbs basically gives us a more lyrical and more technical trap album. You'll get the beats and some of the flows that you would expect from your typical Yo Gotti album, but with a bit more skill and a bit more charisma. And honestly, there's not much more to it than that. It's basically just a Freddie Gibbs album, but with trap music. It's exactly what you would expect, and it'll work for you about as well as you'd expect. My problem with this album is that there are no real surprises to it. The hooks are catchy, but none of them are gonna measure up to Freddie Gibbs at his best. And the production, once again, is pretty standard. You're not gonna hear any experimentation or anything more than you'd hear on your average trap album. So yeah, I'm a little disappointed with it, but at the same time I can't deny that it is good music, and that Freddie Gibbs himself is still a really good performer and rapper. So really, I kind of find myself at a bit of a loss and giving it a solid 6 out of 10. Again, it's good music by a good rapper, but in terms of the projects you could be hearing from him, this definitely isn't the best one. Maybe check out one of those first. So if you were to go back through my album reviews of the past few years, you may notice that one of the most controversial opinions that I ever stated was when I gave Control by SZA a mere 6 out of 10. And look, I stand by that score. SZA is a great performer, I'm not denying her that, but I'm still gonna say that the production on that album wasn't that interesting, and that a lot of it did run together. And I'll be honest, I'm really hard to please in general when it comes to R&B. With some exceptions out there like Janelle Monet and occasionally Beyonce, it's very hard for any R&B performer to really pull me in for an entire project. And so when I got several requests to review this new album by Georgia Smith, I had a singing feeling that I knew exactly what to expect going into it. But I will say, this isn't quite as predictable as I thought it would be. Because Georgia Smith, like SZA, is one of those performers who is distinctive. She's a very soft-spoken and cultured timbre, and it's probably one of the few examples where a strong British accent actually does help you in your music, as it does make her stand out among some of the other R&B performers that I have 
I've heard this year. And her voice kind of lends itself to a more melancholic vibe across this album, which is definitely reflected in the instrumentation, which is often very textured and very soft and very beautiful. But I will say that, once again, just like on Control, a lot of it does run together a bit, specifically because she is the type of performer who can only really sell one type of song, which are mostly relationship songs and love songs where she isn't necessarily the victim, but she does put herself in a more melancholic and sometimes submissive role. Which is why the best song in this album by a mile is Blue Lights, which is a socio-political anthem about how blue lights flashing in the distance can mean death to some people who haven't even done anything wrong. So yeah, it is a pretty album with some really nice production, and Georgia Smith is definitely a very talented singer, but she's not always that captivating, and unfortunately the subject matter doesn't really keep my interest that long either. So in other words, it's getting a very strong 6 out of 10, but if you're looking for R&B that really does push the envelope and that takes its content in more interesting directions, Janelle Monae's Dirty Computer is available for you to listen to. That's all I'm saying. So for our next album of the day, let's talk about one that many of you guys requested. It is The Now Now by Gorillaz. As some of you may remember, I wasn't really a huge fan of Humans. Okay, fine, maybe I was a little bit hard on it, but the production on that album is still bad. Most of the features are just not all that interesting. And the songs themselves, with one or two exceptions from the likes of Vince Staples, aren't catchy or memorable at all. But while my reaction to that album was pretty extreme and negative, that seemed to be the majority of people's reaction to this new one, as supposedly this band had decided to sell out, for lack of a better word. <laughs> sell out! Woohoo! Sell out! Woo! <laughs> I love it! I decided to make a really casual summer album. <laughs> which left many critics kind of feeling cheated or feeling like the gorillas were just phoning it in. And in a way, I do kind of see what they mean. There is a much looser, more light-hearted feeling to this album that a lot of their releases don't have. I mean, after all, you think of the gorillas, you think songs like Feel Good Inc., which is all about dystopian darkness. But this one is kind of casual and fun and laid back. And I honestly liked it way more than I expected. It's not an amazing album by any stretch, but it's catchy, and there are really catchy hooks on this album. You're not gonna get anything quite as iconic as on some of their best albums, and I'm not even gonna say the content is particularly interesting, like, at all. But the features are on point, and this album is still very catchy. And some of these songs, despite having kind of more conventional production than you'd otherwise expect from Gorillaz, still manage to carry across a slight feeling of unease on songs like Trams. So yeah, unlike most critics, I may I actually prefer this to humans. I know a lot of people call it bland and not all that interesting or good, but for me, it's a very strong 6 out of 10. Yeah, I know it's not for everyone, but this did appeal to me, especially during the months of summer this year. So if you have the time, go check it out. I recommend it. So apologies if I sound a little bit hoarse or if I'm maybe lowering my voice a little. I'm filming this at the very end of the day. It is 20 past midnight and uh, I don't want to wake anyone and also my voice is just wrecked. So yeah, we'll be moving a little bit closer up than usual, but with that said, let's talk about this new album by YG. Now some of you may remember me talking about YG before as I named one of his albums, uh, Still Brazy, one of my favorite albums of 2016. Now that album is still great to this day. Going back to it, there are so many highlights that I just love. And almost all of it comes from YG's rapping and his voice matching so well with his production, which is just classic West Coast G-Funk. It really did sound amazing in 2016, and even going back to it today, it's still just as good, if not better. With that said though, I definitely had some reservations going into this new album. For one thing, the lead-off singer 
singles as well as the interviews showed that he was teaming up with DJ Mustard again, which he did on his album a couple of years previously, and I just was not a big fan of. I mean, it's just your standard prototypical DJ Mustard beats, with YG not really being as energetic or as charismatic over them. So why would I want YG to go back to that? And honestly, much like Freddie Gibbs' album, this is pretty much the same kind of deal. I mean, I will say this for him, DJ Mustard has become a better and slightly more interesting producer in the past couple of years. Kind of starting from what he made Post to Be, and even into some of his modern day work, like even on Freaky Friday, the beat is slightly more interesting than it would have been in 2014, but also nowhere near as catchy. Which means a lot of this album is just kind of forgettable. YG is still a cool presence, but he's not particularly skilled on the mic, and while he really can sound awesome here, it's very rare that he properly switches up his flow in a way that interested me. So in many ways, you get an album that is very similar to his 2014 release, as well as kind of reminiscent of listening to Freddy by Freddy Gibbs. As in, you'll get exactly what you expect out of it, whether that's what you like or not. And for me, it's not exactly bad, but it's also not really something that I want to listen to. And I would much rather YG gave up DJ Mustard again and went back to making West Coast hip hop. Not enough people are doing that in my opinion, and while DJ Mustard's sound isn't quite quite as generic as it sounded back in 2014, it's only mildly unique and nostalgic to me to listen to nowadays. So I'll give it a solid 5 out of 10. My advice, leave this for a couple of years, go listen to it, and you may enjoy it a lot more. So some of you may remember that I was one of the few critics to actually give a review to Death Havana last year. And despite giving the album an 8 out of 10, I remember so many people reacting so negatively to that review. I mean, seriously, Death Havana fans, I liked the album, and yet you guys all leapt down my throat about how I didn't get it, or I shouldn't have said some of the things I said. But I still stand by everything I said on that album. It's great, for sure, and it has some amazing songs, but the singles leading up to the album are definitely not the best best songs off of it. And on top of that, I did feel that the album could run together, with too many songs handling the same subject matter in a similar way. But hey, just about one year later, Def Havana decided to release their new album, Rituals. And I'll be honest, the lead-off single, Sinner, had me really hyped for this. It's a fantastic pop song, and while the lyrics are still really melancholic, the chorus just hits you with how powerful and uplifting it is. It's easily one of the most soaring songs that Def Havana have released to date. And while a lot of Def Havana fans, as well as some critics, have come down on this for being a little bit too pop-heavy, I honestly think that they played into their strengths on this. You see, Def Havana has always had a real talent for hooks, and this one really does double down on going for those soaring indie rock slash pop choruses. But on top of being incredibly catchy, it still remains really well written. Maybe not with quite as many as the downer moments as all these countless nights, but this feels like a band reinvigorating and wanting to make new music, while that last album really did feel like them potentially deciding to shut the door on their careers. So yeah, if this is gonna be the brand new chapter that Def Havana take their music in, I'm on board. This is a solid 8 out of 10. I really did enjoy it a lot more than I was expecting. Definitely not everybody's cup of tea, and I wouldn't even say it's their best album, but still an album filled with promise and one that made me curious to see where they take their sound in the future. So meet me at home when the sirens go up I don't want to be alone, so don't you get lost I know a place where the two of us can hide We can barricade the door and we'd be safe inside you know, I've always liked Frank Turner. He always has been a great songwriter, he can make some absolutely heart-wrenching ballads, but he can also make you feel good when you want that. And on this new album, Be More Kind, it's definitely an interesting angle. Basically, in our age where everyone is divided and fighting and arguing over everything, Frank Turner decided to make an album about bringing everyone together and why not just love each other? Just be more kind to the people around you and life will probably be better for it. It's a genuinely nice sentiment 
moment, and he isn't quite naive enough to think that it's just gonna happen like that. And I will say, general cynics are not gonna like this album. They may actually tear it to shreds. But for me, as someone who can actually see the nicer romantic side of things, I actually really did like this album. It's a shot of positivity that we haven't really got much of this year, paired with the still really great songwriting of Frank Turner, as well as his compelling voice. And yeah, it does kind of mean that I don't really have much to say on this album, but it's good, it's fun, and you should check it out. Another very light 8 out of 10, definitely take the time to check this out if you just want to feel good about life. And these days, we could all use a shot of that positivity. And so from there, we go to another rock album that was released this year, this one from a band that I have talked about before. This, of course, is the band Ghost, who have a huge following and who have made my list of the best albums as well as several of the best songs of 2015. And I've been following Ghost for a while at this point. I really would call myself a fan of theirs. However, I will say that behind the scenes, the band's history has gotten a little bit messy. You see, up until this point, their entire image was filled with mystique, where even their frontman name hadn't even been leaked to the public. And yet, due to some disagreements and arguments within the band, where they basically felt that they were getting a back seat to him, they basically broke it off with him and leaked that name to the public as a whole. Now, I'm not going to say what his name is in this video because I feel that would spoil the illusion for some hardcore Ghost fans. And as you'd expect, this album definitely has some really strong highlights. In fact, unlike Zeal and Ardor, I would say that some of the instrumental pieces on this are some of the best songs here. Not to mention phenomenal hooks on songs like Rats and Dance Macabre. But with that said, it doesn't quite tie together as well as their previous album. Meliora was all about bringing incredible hooks with songs about religious subversion and about how the church as a whole has secretly been corrupting us for years. Whereas this album tries to take a similar approach, but unlike that album that takes place in the future, this one takes place in the past, around the Middle Ages. And it doesn't always tie together quite as well. There are just some songs that don't fit here as well as others. And while the production and the hooks are still great, the fact that the main theme of the album feels very scattered and rather vague means that this album is obviously slightly less cutting than their previous one. With that said, I still really enjoyed it. There are still some great hooks here, and if you're a fan of Ghost for their sound, then you will probably be perfectly satisfied by this. I know I was, as I I'm giving it an extremely light 8 out of 10, but if you're looking for the true masterclass that Ghost is, maybe go back to Meliora or some of their older albums. Because while this is still good, the presence of the rest of the band members is a little bit missed here, and I do hope that our dear frontman can just get his head out of his ass and apologize already. And for our final album of the day, let's talk about the new release from The Wonder Years, Sister Cities. So as some of you may remember, this is another one that ended up making my best albums of 2018 so far. For basically doing everything that people were praising Death Havana for doing on all these countless nights. Because this is an album that is filled with melancholy and a feeling that life is not going to get better. And specifically, that you are not good enough to make it through it. But what really made this album album work for me more than all these countless nights ever did was the hope that bleeds through on almost every single track here. While some of these like Pyramids of Salt are just about tearing yourself down about what an awful person you are who makes stupid decisions, there are other moments here where he finds lights at the end of the tunnel. And those lights are other people. Not just people in his immediate vicinity, but people that he's met all over the world. And it strikes our front man that in this time of divide, even in times where he's feeling at his worst, like when his grandfather dies, he can find solace in complete strangers who come from the other side of the world. A place which is so culturally different and yet there are some things that we do have in common. And there is human decency that transcends any difference between us. Basically, it is an album about how no matter where you go in the world, 
you will always find good people. And you'll always find people who surprise you in how good and how like you they can be in ways you would otherwise never expect. And my god, I just loved it. It's so catchy, it's so well composed. It has so many great highlights and more experimental moments. Because after all, this is a band that is known for their emo side. And this is most definitely a step towards alternative rock music. But they make the transition so fluidly while not losing what made them such a great band to begin with. And as someone who has been trying to get into the Wonder Years for years now, I am so happy that they finally managed to bring it all together for me and give me something that I didn't even know I wanted in the first place. Definitely a strong 8 out of 10 and one that you may be seeing on another list at the end of this year. Again, I'm so glad that the Wonder Years were finally able to win me over to their side and it's proof that sometimes being angsty and desperate can still be relatable and not too melodramatic. And that is my time for today, guys. Any more albums you'd like me to check out before the end of the year, leave them in the comments down below. Leave a like and please subscribe so you don't miss a thing. And until the next time, I'm Finn, and this is The Social Tunes, signing off.